Just a bit windy, just a bit windy. Beautiful though. We made it to the sea, people. Look at that, man. This is fairly dangerous, guys, not gonna lie. Look at that lot. I'm about 30 feet up here. That is crazy sea. You see how why it's called the Jurassic Coast? Look at that headland, man. Look at these waves. Woo. Oh man. I would not want to fall in there right now. Okay guys, so although I don't store these leads in, in this one, this hobo reel, I've got my hooks and stuff, lures in there, then the smaller leads and things in this section here, which I'll show you later. But I've brought these along because I knew it was going to be rough today and strong currents. These I wouldn't carry in here necessarily because it just adds to the weight and there's only a small section in here. So I carry these separately either in my pocket or in the backpack. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go straight, a straight sort of uh, ledger on the bottom really rig to be honest. We'll see how it goes. So I've made a loop. I'm just gonna push this loop, if it will fit, through this lead. So there you go, got my lead literally at the bottom of the rig, guys. Then I'm gonna let get about a meter, probably two meters of line off, because I want my hook well above the bottom. I've got loads of little lures, but I'm gonna start with bait, to be honest. And a fairly big-ish hook, well, I say big, probably a size two. So, fairly long shank hook. The actual shank on it's quite long and that's because it's for worm baits. It's got a barb on it. I don't have worm bait. I've got some old frozen sandal, which I brought from home. But let's try this one anyway, let's tie it on. So, if you can imagine, here's my hobo line, or my fishing rod, if you imagine that's my rod. Then coming off from that, straight down is that knot I tied with the hook coming out to the side like that. Then about a meter down, straight to the bottom is my lead, which is probably gonna snag up straight away, but we'll give it a go, guys. Well, they're pretty frozen actually, so hopefully these will defrost a bit better in a minute, but I'm literally just gonna cut them into small chunks. Right, that's my bait, guys, nice and bloody just hanging off the hook, out to the side, off the line. Got a green rag with me to dry your hands. Let's give it a go. Okay, very dangerous on the edge here, guys. I'm looking for a clear patch. About there. Feeling the lead go down. It's down on the bottom now, gonna wind up tight. The lead's getting a hammering. Probably gonna lose all the gear. Look at that, that's beautiful but scary. Look at this wave. Whoa! Holy moly. That is mother nature at its best. Okay, so I'm trying not to move the lead, but obviously every time the swell comes, the big waves, it, it puts tension on the line. So I can loosen the tension of the line by moving the hobo reel closer to this left hand. This left hand's gonna be my striking hand. There's a bite, there's a bite, there's a bite. I'm keeping that tension all the time. but I've got to let these guys eat it because it's a fairly big bait. But as you can see, if I move this away from my hand or closer to my hand, that loosens and tensions the line. So I just had bites. I reckon they've had that bait off the hook already. Cast number three. Just swinging that lead out like this. Then point the hobo reel where you want it to land. That's on the money, I'm telling you now. Tighten up, tighten up, tighten up, tighten up. Got to tighten up fast because you'll miss the bites. The line is just lying across my fingertips because that's the most sensitive part of your fingers is the tips, where the most nerve endings are. And that's where I'm likely to feel the bite de detection of the vibration on the line, the monofilament line, when the fish actually uh, have a bite. So I'm holding the hobo reel up here for tension. In fact, I could wrap a couple more just to keep that tension nice and tight. Oh, I've got fish, got fish, got fish. On the hobo reel, get in. I can feel him. 
Oh, jeez, I don't know how big he is. I don't know how big he is, guys. Oh, we've got a... Oh, oh my God, it's a bass. He's got a bass. Yeah, buddy. I've got a bass. Oh, yes. Wait for it, boys. Wait for it. I'm in a chunking great mess here. Oh my days! There we go. That wouldn't. That would be dinner, but it's illegal to kill these undersized, and that is undersized. But that, my friends, is a bass on the hobo hand line. Get in. Let's uh, get the sunlight right. Let's just admire that, guys. Hobo hand line. A lovely little bass. Beautiful. Now they do have spikes, so you gotta be careful. There we go guys, that's a beautiful little bass on the hand line. Really chuffed with that. Sorry about the uh, stormy conditions. Um, obviously if I was in a survival situation that would be eaten, but I'm not and it's illegal in the UK to kill one this size, it's certainly undersized. Uh, I think 42 centimeters is the legal limit, but Totally awesome. Back he goes. I cannot believe I caught that bass. Guys, you don't understand how difficult bass are to catch in general. Prize eating fish over here. Well, all around Europe, European sea bass is what they call them. I just call them bass, but... The, uh, if you want to protect your, your hobo hand line, obviously lay it down on a towel like I've done here. I've just got a small towel which is to wipe my hands if I'm gutting fish and things like that. Uh, and obviously I don't want to I don't want to lose all the van the nice stain and varnish on this and chip it So just lie it down on that it saves your line rubbing against the rocks as well And then you just eventually, you know monofilament is not great abrasion resistance So if I rubbed it against that rock it would certainly snap so do your best to protect your gear look after it guys Okay, come on bass number two and let's have it about ten times as big please naturally casting in the same spot Although that's a little bit to the right, but who cares? We've got a bass. So that fish was caught further out. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm about 40 feet out. This is risky fishing, guys. 30 feet up high on a cliff, four, casting 40 feet out in a storm surge. That was a that was a lovely bass, but it'd be nice to get something, something a bit bigger, different species maybe. Look at the blood on that. It's lovely. Lovely flavour, that's, that's what you need when you're sea fishing. You need bait that's got really tons of tons of flavour because they get so lost in the washed out salt water, it just gets so lost, the, the, the scent, the flavour. So the better smelling your bait, the more chance you have of catching fish, in my opinion. I think we've got something, boys. That or I've just missed him. I think I missed him. Missed him. Damn it, we had something anyway. A bite. Oh, we've got a fish. We've got a fish. We've got a fish. Yeah, buddy. It looks like a pollock. Uh, a bit too small to eat, though. Let's have a gander. There you go, guys. Another one on the hobo hand line. Is it going to focus on him? Fella, that's a pollock. Again, too small to eat, but another fish either way. Let's get him back, get the bait out again. That's it. That's how far the lead is away from the, the bait itself. I like to keep the bait about there and swing it with my left hand, swing it about 45 degrees in the air, and then point at it with the hobo, the hobo line itself. That way, the, it's like a fishing reel, the line will oscillate and come off you know as easily as possible with the least amount of resistance if you know what I mean so you you throw it about 45 degrees in the air and point at it and follow it down
Well guys, I haven't caught anything for the last two hours now. I've been here four hours. That's just not happening at the moment. So I think I'm gonna move spots or maybe uh, hike down the, uh, the coastal path a little bit further. See if I can catch something else down there. It could be the, t the tide conditions. Um, I've just had slack tide for about an hour. So the tide's on the ebb now, it's on the way out. Um, I prefer a flood tide to be honest, but it's just not happening here at the moment. I've had no more bites. The, the swell's getting worse. Uh, there's much more weed in the water, it's getting on the hook. So it's just not really happening. So the plan is, pack the gear up, hike on down maybe half hour, 40 minutes, further down the cliff to see if there's any other spots down uh, to see if I can get another sort of bait out and maybe get some more fish as the tide goes out, who knows? That's the ledge I was on just down there. That little ledge. It looks little but it's actually 30 feet above. And as you can see, that's a pretty damn big coastline. That, that cliff's pretty big. What a view. Woo. That's awesome. I've got about a 40 minute, 50 minute trek now to the next place. I've got my map with me, so let's crack on. I thought I'd show you guys this. Wild carrot here on the south coast of England. That bit's not, but and you can see the seeds there. It's not ready to drop its seeds yet, but probably another month, month and a half. But these seeds, as they are now, when they're slightly green brown like this, they have a lovely citrusy flavour and uh, you can actually cook them on, just use them as seasoning on fish. Like they'd be good on a sea bass and things like that. But you can eat these like they are, or like I say, you can season them. But these are the greener ones. <clears throat> they'll go brown and almost black and then they'll drop off probably in a few months time. But they, they have a real strong citrusy smell to them. I would use these on fish later guys, but I don't know if you guys can see that. They're, they're on my hand there. Mm. Very, very sort of citrusy taste, but you can see how they'd be really good as a seasoning. They're kind of, they're, they're all right on their own, but very strong citrusy taste. But <clears throat> with a seasoning on some fish, they'd be amazing. Well, blackberries are still here. They're going though, they're getting a bit soft. That one's all right. Might as well take it while I can use it. Get some vitamins. They've probably got another two weeks left and then the blackberries are done, I think, but might as well have some. There's a few here. Apologies for the jet noise. Oh, they're quite bitter. Definitely on their way out, I'd say. But, vitamin C done. Mm. Well, guys, I've walked for about an hour now. Maybe even longer, I don't know. Getting tired, sun's actually starting to set. I didn't, I didn't set off until about 11 a.m. because obviously I had to drive down here and that took about uh, two hours to get down here. So by 11 o'clock, then I had to get my gear sorted and then I was off walking to get to the first fishing spot. Now I'm getting to the second fishing spot and potentially overnight spot, but this, I'm losing light pretty fast. It's September now. When I'm filming this, it's mid-September. Um, and it's we've lost sort of two hours of light compared to when we normally do peak summer so it gets dark about 7 30 now and it's nearly six o'clock so got, i've got time to get down here i think i've got another 10 15 minutes obviously i'm hungry i'm craving a bit more fishing for those fishermen out there you know what it's like you get the bug and d dusk is a great time for fishing as well you know sea and coarse fresh water so this is amazing though haven't met one person completely alone for so far all day which is awesome especially in England where it's seriously overpopulated but I'm gonna switch off guys focus on the walk and I'll get some water and I'll see you guys by the coast how spooky is this guys look at those caves I think this is an old quarry look at that definitely be investigating those later that's mad Creepy, doing an overnight here. That is where the wind's coming from, the north. Whew, straight over there, so there's no wind in here. It's just monsters. It's like it's some sort of sacrificial pit. Big cliffs there, man. Look at this. There's the sea. We'll go and check it out in a minute and then we'll check those out. Probably have to camp near one of those. I wouldn't want to camp under that though. Still not seen anyone today. 
Okay, so I think fishing's off the cards, boys. I'm about 100 feet up. Yep, no fishing. Look at the waves, though. Beautiful. And there is the stunning South English coastline. Part of it anyway, the Jurassic Coast. Guys, I'm actually in one of the caves and there's bats in here. My focus is really struggling to hold, to pull focus, the camera, but I've seen bats and everything. Proper creepy. It goes back miles. Explore that in a minute with a torch. Look at this way. Boom. Look at it. If you were a surfer, man, you'd be dead. <laughs> I've reached the end. I can't walk around any further. This is as far as I can go. All along here on the insides there's little caves, so I might overnight in one of these little ones, I think. Just little alcoves that kind of tuck in. There's one just around here, I'll show you. That's a long way down. You can tell it's deep. When you look at there, that's how, how big the cliffs are. There you go, that's probably where I'll go tonight. Seems like someone's been here before, there's evidence of a fire. A couple of fires. There, there, there. That's where I'll go tonight though. Bit of graffiti in there, so probably teenagers. But, perfect for a little sleep. Well guys, I think it's time to get some food on. I'm absolutely starving. As you can see, there's no trees here. So I can't really do much bushcraft in the sense of fire lighting. These people have had fires before, have obviously brought stuff down. But I'm thinking gas stove today. Uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't kill that bass earlier, it was undersized, it would have been illegal. That pollock was way too small. Uh, I've always got backup food with me just in case, so I've just got a kind of boil in the bag job, meatballs or something like that, and the gas stove. Always do that, guys, it's sensible. You know, when you're doing three day trips, which this is a three day trip, I'm not going to come with no food at all, that's just mad. That's, that's putting yourself in a survival situation and I don't need to do that. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I've not got anything to prove to anyone. I'm just here to enjoy the outdoors. So I do bring, a, I will bring a gas stove. I've got it in my bag. And that way I've got a boil in the bag food as well. I haven't got enough food for all three days or, or, or two nights. I haven't got enough food. I've literally got enough food for, for one night really. So I've got a little bit of rice, which I'm hoping to catch some fish to then cook in the rice. But like I say, I've got nothing to prove. You know, don't feel guys out there that you have to go out and try and, you know, live off the land straight away. It, it doesn't work like that. You need years and years of knowledge, and I don't have that knowledge yet to be able to just live off the land. I could have killed those fish earlier and survived quite easily. You know, probably three or four days on that on that bass, but got nothing to prove. Put it back, release it, enjoy the outdoors. Going to cook up something with this stunning view, take it all in and enjoy it, and then maybe you know get a bit get a bit of wild food tomorrow. I've had some blackberries. I've had some carrot seeds. I've got some trail mix, some nuts, so I'm all right for the night, but I'm damn starving, so let's get some food on. Turns out I bought an all day breakfast for evening dinner. Oh well. My gas is really compact or packable. It's dead simple to put together. It's all sort of like a flat pack stove, really. But I really enjoy this stove. I've used it so much. Those who saw my three-day mountain trip video will know that I used this stove in that one. And C3, C300 canister, Coleman one. It's like one of the high-performance ones, really good jet boil on it. It's got its own. Just gonna stick this in the billy. Very even. <laughs> Get that boiling.
with a view. This is one of the Wayfarer ones. I really like the Wayfarer ones. To be fair, they're quite exp they are expensive. I'm not sponsored by them. It costs me a lot of money. Meanwhile, it'd be rude not to. Let's face it. Old Empire IPA from Marston's Brewery. Don't think I've had the Old Empire before. Five point seven percent. Giggity goo. Beer by the ocean, eh? Can't beat it, boys. Ooh, a quiet one for a change. Cheers, guys. This is my room for the evening. A 10, probably 10 by five foot cave. With a view. Premium room. All day breakfast. At seven o'clock in the evening. Oh, well, I'm English, so you can eat all day breakfast whenever. It's finally cold enough to eat. And it's nice. They have about 500 calories, 560 calories per bag, so easily sorted. So you're probably thinking, Mike, why are you wearing such a thick jacket in September? And that's because we actually had loads of rain earlier. I don't know, you probably didn't see it on the, uh, the camera. I shut it all down because we had so many heavy rain showers come in, I had to just stop filming. Um, Temperatures today have been about 15 degrees Celsius, but they're going down to eight degrees Celsius tonight, and that's here on the coast. And my sleeping bag is only rated to 10 degrees, a comfort of 10 degrees, because it's my summer bag still. So I'm hoping that really this this kind of cliff here is sheltering the wind. If this wind swings round to a southwesterly or a southerly, I'm screwed because it's coming right in my face. Uh, and if it's cold, it shouldn't be with a south southwest uh, over here in England. But if it is cold it will just ruin it for me. But if a, nor if a cold northerly wind comes at me, it's gonna come hit the cliffs first, so I'm not gonna be affected down here. Although it just brings cold temperatures. Okay guys, um, so I've got my sleeping bag just attached to the bottom of my bag here with some homemade straps that I did, because this particular is a military surplus pack. Um, it doesn't come with a bottom strap like this. I do have a tent with me, I've carried it in my hand. Uh, this might, I, I might use this tomorrow night. Uh, I'm not going to use a tent tonight, just sleep out in the open. open. Uh, but there's no top strap on this as well, it's the only downside of this bag, there's no top straps and bottom straps, unlike my bigger pack which I prefer because it's, in a way, it's got the top straps and bottom straps to secure bed rolls, sleeping bags, things like that. However, uh, it does have these kind of molly, well they're not molly, they're Alice, they're for the Alice clips, these things, uh, the military Alice clips. Um, but what I've done is, I've, these are all over on the bottom as well, and they, they, you can just loop through, I'll put a carabiner on the top one here, my sleeping bag sometimes hangs from that. But I've actually fashioned some straps now down at the bottom, so I can just undo these. Off comes the sleeping bag, and the straps are just here at the bottom, they can be used again. Uh, it's just handy, because then I don't have to use the space, it's, it's very limited inside, it's only 25 litre. So this is a relatively lightweight three day trip, to be honest. What I'm gonna do, guys, I've got zero phone reception down here and if something happens to me I'm probably in quite a bit of trouble so uh, in my first aid kit which I keep in here a bit of food first safety that's my uh, breakfast really and trail mix which I've been using just some mixed nuts dried fruit uh, hot chocolate I've got coffee instant coffee as well but this is my first aid kit it's what I keep in here all the time and uh, I've been using the Pentagon one for a couple of months now uh, I've got a video coming up, by the way, of my first aid kit, everything that's in it, which you will see probably maybe after this video. Um, I've had so many questions about what do you put in your first aid kit. There's a video coming up on it, really in-depth video. Uh, but I do need, and I am going to take out this. And that is the Shoreline, the Marine Whistle. Really flat-packed, 
incredibly bright orange, but I'm not going to blow it in case someone's walking around and think I'm uh, in an emergency. But this is really loud, and if something happens to me, if I've injured myself or something, I will blow this really loud to see if I can get someone's attention. Not sure how much help it will be at 3 o'clock in the morning, but, you, you, you know, it, it's, a, it's a necessity for a first aid kit. So I will take that out now, and I've got that in my pocket near me, just in case something happens, because I haven't seen anyone all day, and there's no sign of, you know, that those fires that people have had here are very old, so... I don't think people have come here for a while. So I'd rather be safe than sorry. Keep this in my pocket, in the cargo pouch down here. Now I can just enjoy the view. You can enjoy it with me. Bit wonky, sorry. There we go. Cheers guys, wherever you're watching, thank you for watching TA Outdoors. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate all your comments, your likes, your subscriptions if you are subscribed. And yeah, enjoy life in the outdoors. And you can see where I was earlier today. I'll show you. Right in the distance, don't know if you guys can see this, on that headland, on that headland over there, there's a lighthouse. Just there. I was the other side of that lighthouse, so I walked all the way around, all the way around there, around to here. Ready to pick up day two. Guys, I'm not on my own. There's a boat. I think the sun's just set, I can't tell now. Because the cliff's in the way. But I'm judging it by the sun on the cliffs over there. So it's definitely set because we're getting some shadow over here now. So this is probably the most level area of ground. Uh, I've got myself my self-inflating mat, which I've used on previous trips. Um, this one has kind of foam padding inside it as well. Some of them you can get where they're just air and they just rebound the heat um, back into you and there's no kind of material inside, but this one has material inside. Um, it's self-inflating. Although I like to blow it up as well. There's only a small one, it only goes down to the back of my knees because that's all I need covered really. Uh, so it is only really small, but I'm only a small person, so it doesn't matter to me. Nice bushcraft green. So I just undo the valve and let that sort itself out. I just un undo the valve and let that sort itself out for probably about five minutes and then I'll actually manually blow some air into it as well because it's really rocky here. So. I want as much air as possible in there so I don't feel those rocks through my back. Then the sleeping bag will go on top of that uh, and then I've got a self-inflated pillow. Same principle with my pillow as the self-inflating mattress. It even has the same pimple kind of grips on the back of it but it's just held together with a bit of elastic and unravel it. Green on one side actually, bush crafty colour. Undo the valve, you'll hear it. That's now inflating, and if you guys can see that. It will naturally inflate on itself, just leaving it like that, but you can force air into it as well through the valve. That just um, speeds the process up, and, and you know, some people want a really stiff pillow, <coughs> or soft pillow, some people want a really hard pillow. I've still not got these quite right yet, where I've woken up with neck ache most of the time using these, but whatever. Beggars can't be choosers, eh? Because I've blown this mattress up, I don't feel the rocks through, through it. Whereas a roll mat, I'd probably feel it. That's not too bad, it's pretty comfy. Obviously my legs stick over the end, but they'll be in a sleeping bag anyway. That's not bad. I always make sure my pillow when I'm lying on my side is level, you know, it's like my head's level and in line with where my spine would be as if I was standing up. If it was too high like that, you get a neck ache. And if it's too low like that, where your body's higher than your, your head, you're gonna get neck ache as well. So what I did is I blew the pillow up as much as I could. Then I laid on it 
and it was slightly high, so I just undid the valve till my head slowly sunk down till it was level with my spine. Then I did the valve up. The sleeping bag can go. Sleeping bag. So it's starting to get a little bit chillier now. Um, I just thought I'd sort of go through what I put on towards the evening time when it's sort of autumn, where you work quite a bit in the day and it's still fairly warm in the daytime but the evenings are really cold. It's a very wonky horizon going on over there Mike. Better. Uh, so what I've got is a merino wool long sleeve top which I'll put on now because if I put that on when it's really cold later I've got to take my top off to put that on. I won't film that don't worry ladies. But because I've got to take my top off to put it on uh, I don't want to do that when it's freezing cold because then my, my upper body will lose all that heat so I'll do it now before it gets too, too cold later. Then I've got this neck buff. I have a range of neck buffs. You've seen me wear them in the Camp Update 11, but <clears throat> these really help actually. This is a thermal one. And all it does is just go, goes over you like that. And then often when I'm doing wild camping on my own at night, just not my own, but often when I'm wild camping at night, <clears throat> in the winter months, your lungs get, it gets really cold breathing air and, you, and your nose gets really cold and you, it often wakes you up. So I got one of these thermal ones and you just, you look like a bit of a thug when you do it, but you just tuck it over like that and it keeps your ears warm and you breathe, you can breathe through them and it breathe, it filters that air and turns it into warm air generally. It's like breath, breathing kind of through a blanket, but you know, less restrictive. Uh, obviously you've got my hat. I don't walk around a day like this because <laughs> I look like a, I look like I'm going to rob someone, but guys, it keeps you warm at night. That's all that matters. So let's get the merino wool top on. Bats everywhere. Look at them. Amazing. In a cave with bats. That's amazing. That is actually awesome. So many. I really like bats. Don't know about you guys, but grossly misinterpreted creatures bats are, I think. They are awesome. Really awesome. And there's so many in this cave. Bat cave. I am the Batman. It's amazing. This is literally my cave here that I'm in. And they're just, look, whoa, they're just flying past. Oh, oh, there's loads of bats in here. This is mad. Absolutely mad. It's becoming night time. I mean, this is realistically how dark it is. Hold on, let me tell it. That's how dark it is now. On the real camera setting. Not boosted ISO, look. The... Don't know if you guys can see the lighthouse going. Wait for it. There we go. That means it's definitely getting darker. Guys, I'm about to get in the sleeping bag. Don't know if you can still hear the ocean. I'm certainly going to hear it all night. About to get in. Hit the sheets. Call it. A, call it a night. It's ten o'clock now. Um. Hopefully I'll get a good night's sleep. I'm sure the ocean will keep me up or lull me to sleep, I don't know. I'm tired. It's been a long day, but a fun day. Looking forward to some more fishing tomorrow. Maybe a bit more bushcraft too, if I can find some woodlands. Thank you very much for watching, guys. See you in the morning. Morning, guys. I had probably, I didn't sleep great to be honest. I've literally just woken up, it's about seven o'clock. Uh, it didn't get nowhere near as cold as I expected last night. And yeah, just the waves, man. It's not quite like sleeping next to a lovely little beach where the waves trickle up. It's like thunder all the time, huge waves. I wouldn't recommend sleeping this close to the cliff when there's waves this big out. Whoa. What a view though.
Look at that sunrise. Stunning sunrise, people. So tired. So tired. I think I'm gonna have a hot chalk and then some porridge and just enjoy this blimmin' lovely, lovely sunrise. That's what wild camping's all about, people. Looks like a sunset. That is amazing. Ugh. my hot chocolate got my awesome view I've actually set the GoPro up I don't know if you guys can see it just to do a time-lapse of that Sun he's just down there I'm trying to get a time-lapse of the uh, the sunrise I'm a bit late to be honest it was about an hour ago but look at it such an amazing thing to wake up to so hopefully in a minute some sick footage will drop of an awesome time lapse. So trust me, I give you that heartbeat moving fast. The only way I know, the only way it is. Come near me, don't fear me. That's why I'm running, running, just looking for you. So what I'm going to do now is pack all the gear up, hike, probably maybe back to where I was. What I want to do today really is a bit more foraging. Uh, yesterday the tide wasn't right when I got here. Uh, it was coming up high tide. I was never going to be able to do any foraging anyway. Ideally you need the tide to be falling and you need to go out at low tide. Um, so what I'm going to do, I've got the right tides today. It's low at 1.30 I think, so I've got five or six hours. Um, and it's going out so I've got plenty of time I'm gonna hike along to maybe a little beach or cove um, and then hopefully see if I can get a few wild edibles because I'm running out of food obviously um, and then hopefully get back out with a hand line I might go back to that original spot as it you know the, the, the winds have completely changed today so as, as opposed to a northerly or northwesterly which we were having yesterday it swung right around to southerly southwesterly and it's coming in this way but it's much warmer it's only about forecasted about 10 9 10 mile an hour today not 20 so that other fishing spot although it be in the face um, it won't be nowhere near as big swell so and I can see that by today you can see the waves there's just not as big a swell around so that's the plan anyway guys let's pack up let's get out of here let's leave no trace the world stops. So these are the straps I made that I was talking about yesterday. They just tuck through the arm loop, basically. <clears throat> they're not obviously amazingly strong or reinforced, but they're enough to hold this sleeping bag. That's all I need. There we go. Tuck that little bit right there. So there's no dangly bits, and we're sorted to go. Goodbye, little cave. Thanks for holding me up for the night. Sun's getting wet up now. Time to move that way. What a beautiful morning. Look at all these plants right on the edge of this huge cliff. Awesome. Oh, look at that lot down there. Do not fall off. 
It's a long way down. And when you're sea fishing, you're restricted with the tide if you want to get good fishing. So the cave exploring shall have to wait for another day. That is impressive. A rock climber's dream. Awesome. Let's crack on, boys. So I've walked about 40 minutes now. Gonna have a break and talk to you a little bit about my hobo handline or my hobo reel. Um, I'm about a mile now from the actual bay that I want to get to where the, the tide should be low in about two hours time, so I've still got plenty of time. But I thought I'd chat to you guys quickly just about this because I know some of you might be asking or wondering, you know, what exactly is it and how does it work? It's basically a, a hobo handline. You can use anything to, to do it. You can actually use tin cans as a great one for beginners. Obviously be aware that tin can be sharp, but you can use tin cans. You can use just a normal stick. This is obviously made out of wood. This was made by a subscriber of mine called John and his friend, I believe, uh, they turned them on a, on a pole lathe and actually it looks nothing like this when John gave it to me. So John, you're probably watching this going, Mike, that's, that's not the one I gave you. It is the one I gave, you gave me. Um, I've just, you know, done it up a bit and, and done stuff to it. Um, so let me talk you through what exactly I've done. Firstly, uh, let's talk through the, the, the outer coating here because if you look, this was actually, I think it's pine. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure it's pine. It's very, very light, very soft wood. It was very light coloured when I had it. So what I did to get this kind of spalted effect, if you guys can see that, hopefully you can see that. If I focus there, it's got like a spalted effect to it. And what I did is I actually got some dark oak varnish and I kind of didn't spread it evenly. I spread it quite thick and that's how you get that kind of spalted look to it. It looks like spalted wood which is like my cookser. Those who watch the show, the TA Outdoors a lot, you'll see my cookser. Um, that's what it kind of looks like, and that's how I got that effect. So it is deliberate, um, and I did use it with some varnish and just blob it on, really. Um, and that's the, the kind of colour I went for, so it's quite nice. So as you can see on the outside, obviously got my fishing line here. This is 12 pound monofilament line. Now I can change this depending on what I'm gonna fish. It's fairly heavy, 12 pound is heavy, and that's because I'm sea fishing. If I was freshwater fishing, I would probably change this to six pound, uh, maybe even ten pound maximum. Uh, Twelve pounds fairly heavy for uh, you know if I'm ca trying to catch trout or small fish from a, from a freshwater stream or lake. Um, but because I am sea fishing, I need to up my gear. So I've got twelve pound monofilament line on there. It's very tough. Uh, this this particular brand of line is very tough, durable. Uh, it's kind of a grey colour. It's more for carp fishing really, but. Um, I just spooled it out from one of my fishing reels and I've also gone for a float here. This hobo reel is actually, I change it depending on what I'm fishing for. If I'm in a freshwater fishing scene and I'm doing rivers for small fish or lakes, it would be completely different. I would have a different type of float, a much smaller, much thinner diameter float, which is less resistance because they're a bit more finicky. In the sea, because it's, you know, the waves and choppy ocean and things like that, I need a thicker float. So that's why I've gone for that, so I can see it clearly in amongst the surf. So thicker float, which I haven't used yet, I've been ledgering. Uh, and generally, in the uh, traditional kind of hobo reels, the lid pops off like this. Now what I've done, again with this lid, if you can see that, I've put some tape on it, just some electrical tape. Just a small thin bit, not all the way around, just on the sides, and that's so that it can pinch and it actually cinches in that gap when I push it down. Because if I'm casting out and I'm throwing it and pointing at the, uh, the bait like I did yesterday, uh, that lid could come flying off. And I don't want that because, it, especially in the sea, I'm not getting that back. So that's what that is for, to help pinch that lid on. Inside, there's a fair amount of storage in here. If I stand up, maybe you'll be able to see that. And what I've got is some artificial lures. I'll just show you a few of them. I haven't used these yet, I might use these later. Soft plastic artificial lures. Some hooks. Okay, I know it's not very clear, but you can see they're worm hooks, they're long shank hooks. There's another one there that's slightly bigger, that hook, that's an easier one to show you. There you go. Long shank for the for if I'm using worms or generally, you know, long sliver baits. I call them sliver baits for sea fish. Uh, and I've also got a small packet, which I'll show you again in more detail later, of some jig heads, which is basically a lead moulded around a hook uh, with a little eye on it that you tie to your line. And then th that would they, these jig heads would fit these this size lure, nice and small. Okay, I've got different coloured lures as well for different situations, but I'll get into that in a bit more detail later. So that's hooks and lures in the top there. Now underneath, John, you probably don't recognise this as well, but what I've done is I hacked your handle apart. Sorry, buddy. But this was just a normal handle at the bottom here. 
There was nothing inside this, it was just a handle. But I thought I can use that for storage. There's enough room in there to be able to drill a hole and store something in there. So what I did is I cut, you can see the line I cut there, I cut off the bottom of the handle. Put a screw in the top of it. That screw is to help me hold it, to pop it open, and if I wiggle it, there's a cork. I fashioned up a little cork from an old wine bottle. Focus is, there you go. So I used the cork, and that just keeps this hole sealed shut. Now, naturally you have to open this that way up, and then I can tip it in my hands to show you what's in here. So, I've got a spare elastic band. Let me just put the uh, hobo line down. I've got a spare elastic band to go around the spool, which would pinch my float in as well as pinch the line in here. Otherwise, the line's just going to unravel all the time. So I've got a spare elastic band in case that one snaps. And then in the bottom of the handle, if you guys can see this, there is all my lead weights, small lead weights. So we've got these, these are special kind of drop shot weights, these ones. Um, if you watch TA Fishing, um, Drop Shot Diaries this is a series I, I sort of do on TA Fishing YouTube channel where I talk about all about these weights and they're, they're very useful weights. Then I've got loads of, uh, this is a Cherubruska weight, or Cherubruska weight, sorry. Um, I'm not going to get too much detail about that, it's very much more for specific fishing. And loads, I don't know if you can see that, I need to angle the camera down. There are loads of small split shot. These you just pinch on your line. and They just pinch on your line and they you can put they help set the depth, plumb the depth of a float. They set the depth of your float. So that's all my little lead weights there. Mostly fresh water weights. I wouldn't use these sea fishing because obviously the sea is much, you know, there's much more swell and tide and movement in the water in sea fishing. So I use those big cannonball leads, you know, and, and sort of couple ounce leads, one ounce to one and a half ounce leads. These are just little BB shots, swan shots. Um, double A shots, things like that, number ones as well. Um, but yeah, those go in there. And I store all those in the bottom of the hobo hand line, the hobo reel or hand line, depends what you want to call it. Store them in like that. Sorry about the focus on the camera, the noise. And then this just fits flush, as you can see if I twist it around, fits flush like that. And that isn't going anywhere. I can shake that, those leads aren't pushing that out because I've made the cork so that it just fits nice and snug. So that's what I caught the bass on yesterday, that's what I caught the small pollock on yesterday as well. Hopefully I'm going to catch some more on it maybe later this afternoon. I'm going to forage first, see what I can find. And yeah, I'll use this probably later on this afternoon, hopefully catch some more fish. Might try some float fishing as well, uh, depending on the sea conditions. But you can make your own guys, you can just use a long thin piece of stick, hollow out the bit, the middle bit, it's up to you. World's your oyster, this is obviously very well made. Um, so I'd like to thank John, thank you very much man, for or, or your friend, I can't remember which one of you made it, but I appreciate you sending me this. John actually sent me an axe as well with his uh, his son, Kieran, sent me an axe, so really appreciate it, it's getting good use. Uh, I will do some freshwater fishing with this if you guys want to see it at some point, but right now I'm going to head down to the coast and see what I can forage. The crows. And not one human in sight, except me. All right, let's go. That's where I need to go. Long way yet. Oh, made it guys, made it. That headland over there, tide's still going out. But that little headland over there looks like it would definitely have some shellfish. And it'd probably be quite, I can see some kelp coming up from it. It'd probably be quite good for uh, general fishing with the hobo that hand line. So I'm gonna give that a go. Found our first wild edibles seaweed. There's plenty of it here. <clears throat> I believe this is called forest kelp. And kelp is very, very rubbery. Um, you can eat this raw, although most people wouldn't. And you generally can dry it out. You're meant to dry it out, sun dry it, crush it into a chowder or powder. And um, you can use it as seasoning. Uh, you, can, you can boil it. Uh, just to, to sort of make it a bit less rubbery, but you can, it's also very easy to over boil. Very tough. You know, you can't even, you can split it like this. You could use it for cordage, like so. It's obviously very salty, but you can chew on it. You can get the goodness, but you can get the goodness out of it sometimes when you're hiking, just chewing on it and just biting and squeezing all that goodness out that's the best way I've found to eat it raw anyway because actually eating it you know in bulk raw is, is not very nice 
much better dried out like most seaweed to dry it out and use it as kind of a, a, a powder or a chowder um, and seasoning and things like that but it's kind of got your classic sea, seafoody seaweed taste but sugar cups a bit more golden this is kind of all weed I would say forest cups a bit darker but one edible there's also some rack here you guys can see that looks like um might be sawtooth rack actually or saw rack but it's got little sacks on it now can you see that sorry guys i know the quality is really not that great but that's some rack there that's edible as well and these are the little egg sacks which i believe contain the uh reproductive part of the plant so if you're into that kind of thing they're actually all right um, but you can eat obviously the soft the young you want the young shoots like this one Yeah, the little young fresh shoots like that That's the Oh much better sort of sea taste We got ourselves some more edible seaweed This is called gutweed and Reason being if you can see that it looks like guts the intestines It's called gutweed very very common in the kind of splash zone uh, you can eat it raw, but again, dried out, uh, just dry it out in the sun. Sun-dried seaweed's always the best. Um, and you, again, you can crush it up, use it as a seasoning, as a powder, but you can eat it raw. Awesome. That's what we're after. Limpets. You have to be really careful with limpets. In the sense that if I touch this rock, they're gonna know I'm there. They're, they're sucked onto the rock at the moment. And if I stood on this or touched it or knocked it, the kind of tongue part of the, uh, the limpet will grip to the rock. So what you need is another rock. I've seen people prize them off with knives. My dad does it quite a lot, but it's just, it blunts your knife. You don't need to. So you get yourself another rock. And there you go. Got to be quick about it. There is a limpet. Now there's a few more on this rock here, kind of a family of limpets. If I knocked all of these off, I've destroyed a whole generation of limpets and it's, it's sort of not fair. So, you know, if you're doing this sustainably, there's not many calories in that at all. Um, especially once I boil it, it's going to shrivel up. So I'm going to collect quite a few, but I'm going to also, you know, go around different rocks there's some behind me, there's loads everywhere. There's no point destroying one colony on one rock just because of the sake of it's easy, you know? You've got to go around, move around and try and do it that way. For example, there's one just here behind me. Got a few limpets there. Bang these off. Whoa, that wave was close. There you go, another one off. First time. If I tap them too much, they're gonna suck up and it's gonna be really difficult to get them. Here's a tip, when you're storing them, on a rock to come back later, put them this way up. If you put them back this way, he's just gonna to suck to the rock. Limpets feed on all the algae on rock, and they're generally quite safe to eat uh, because they're not bivalves like a mussel, you know, so they don't, mussels filter, can filter in the bad bit stuff as well, so these are generally okay. Um, but like I say, don't put them down that way because they'll re, they'll re stick to the rock and you won't get them back off again. He's gonna be stuck that one. There's a few under there, but they're not on a flat rock. Got to watch the side here, got to be a bit careful. Got to watch that. Finding the flat rock. Got one. Another one. Thank you. 
Ah, uh, look. You can actually see up here where they've moved around. Hold on. Whoa. Here you go. That's where the limpets move around. You can see what they do. They kind of eat away. That's the patches of rock that they've been on. And they just move around this whole rock here. Even these black dots, this is all marks where they've been. They move around, they recolonize, reproduce, more and more of them come onto a rock. There's loads up the other side. Like I say, don't take them all though, guys. Sustainable, think sustainable. Go to different rocks. Look, there's millions of limpets around here. Literally millions. Hit my hand. Some work, some don't. We're good. We got enough. They stick to each other as well, guys, their shells. Look, he's sticking to that one. Be aware of that when you're storing them. You can use them as fishing bait as well. Let's find our way back to base camp. Tide's probably on its way in. Another thing to be wary of is the tide. Don't just do it and not think about where the tide's going. Trying to get some wood for the fire. There's some sort of small dead trees just up here. I'm hoping they're dead anyway, in a way, because then it'll make getting the firebox going easier. If not, I've got the gas stove as backup, guys. That's the whole point of bringing it. This looks pretty dead, though. Let's test. Yep, dead. Don't know how well it will burn though. Weird, I don't know what it is. Breaks well enough. Some sort of sea shrub. Got enough wood, hopefully. Whoa. soon find out. Let's see if I can get it going on the firebox. I bought this because it's, you know, I've trekked quite far and it's flat packed at least, so a little bit more portable than other stoves. I've got other wood burning stoves, but this has been very consistent for me. Okay, let's get to go. Fresh lipids coming up. It's a great thing about the firebox, you can just stick stuff in through the sides. All you do with the limpets, literally just pop them in with their shell and let them boil for about, well, about eight minutes till they separate from their shell, really. What I do when the fire's burnt right down like that and I'm not going to put any more wood on it or I'm low on wood, I just use the, the other two kind of support poles to the firebox and it's got different levels of adjustment. So I just stick them through slightly lower and then this one slightly lower so that it's nearer the flames. Then obviously I take this off, flip these aside just like so and then I can lower it even further down so that I'm still utilising the heat that's left in the firebox, but I'm not having to put any more wood on it. And that's obviously way hotter because it's overflowing. There we go, we're boiling again. So I'd lost the boil, but I've used, I've not put any more wood on it. I've just utilised the heat in the convection by lowering the actual pan itself, keeping it just above the tip of the flames where it's hottest. 
and they, I can see they're separated from the shell already, so shouldn't take too long, probably another minute. The longer you cook them, the, the more rubbery they get, really. They're rubbery as they are, but nearly done. I can smell them. They smell lovely. Look at that limpet, boy. Look at that limpet. Just going to take that off. Now, obviously, I don't. I could drink that water when it's cooled down and use it as like a broth. It's got all the nutrients in it still. So I'm just going to use the point of my knife. Just use the tip of my knife to get them out. They're separated from the shells. Now, you, you can just eat these like this, but however, on the back is what's called the gut sack. And you can eat it with the gut sack on. A lot of people do. Uh, I personally don't because obviously that's the gut sack. It's generally where all the guts go. So you just break that off like so. You can see the guts inside, little mini intestines and things. Pull it out. And that. That's ready to eat as it is. You can see the little uh, antenna, <laughs> little feelers on the front there. But they're very rubbery, but they are very nice tasting. Very sort of seafoody taste. So there you go, there's a the limpet. There's the kind of, you can see how much they shrink. There's barely any calories in this, guys. There's plenty of goodness in them. Um, you know, obviously protein, but but calorie-wise, there's barely any calories. You need to eat a lot of these to actually keep you going. But there's the actual foot, what's called the foot, the, the limpet there. There's the gut sack on the back. I prefer to rip that off. Pull the gut sack off. And there it is. That is, that is the limpet there. And that's ready to eat. One prepared limpet. One very rubbery limpet, but tasty all the same. Mm. And also, what you can do, uh, let's use this one. The limpet shells themselves are actually incredibly hard, and they are awesome for a bow drill. If I focus on it. They're awesome for a bow drill kit. Obviously, I don't have a bow drill kit here. But you can use this as a bearing block. And generally the ones with more barnacles on, if this will focus, yeah. Generally the ones with more barnacles on them are, are harder shells, they're older limpets. And inevitably the barnacles are above the limpet themselves, so you don't actually feel the heat coming through the bow drill. But you just place your hand on the, on the bearing block like that, on the limpet shell, place it on top of the, your stick, get your bow drill going, burning away, your spindle spinning around like this, and the heat generally doesn't go through the shell, but you can double up and use two shells like that. Double up and use two shells. And look, they don't take up much, take up much size at all. So, quick little tip there, use them as a bow drill. Anyway, I've got a few more to eat, so I'm gonna eat these bad boys. And then, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh, ow, oh. still hot. Remove the gut sack. Rubbery. I think I've boiled them a bit too long. They're quite chewy. But they go down all the same. Right. So I'll wash this with some stones. In order to prevent this to rust, I'm obviously going to have to run this under some fresh water, maybe by a river, really soon on the way back, just to stop it rusting. But for now, get rid of all the ash and cool it down really fast so I can get on my way. Whew. Just 
Keep going, buddy. Whoa, that's slippy. Yes, please. Ooh. Much needed energy. So overgrown. Well guys, we made it back to the coast, the same spot. Look how different it is. Nowhere near as much swell, so much clearer. It's absolutely peed it down with rain a minute ago. I don't know if you guys can see this, but look how clear it is. Look at that, you can see all the rocks. That's way better. I'm not gonna float fish, I'm gonna ledger. I'm gonna get that, that bait down there with the lead like before. Completely different story to yesterday. Fish first cast, go on, son. Oh, come on. We've had so much rain. Look at the thunder clouds on the horizon. What? Serious storms out there. I got caught in one rain rainstorm a minute ago. But this is just lovely. This is way better than we had before. Oh, I think we've got a I think we've got a fish. I think. I'm not sure, boys. I'm not sure. Uh, there's a fish on here, I think. Come on, buddy. What is it? I think it's small, whatever it is. Oh, there's a fish. There is a fish. Woo. That's a long way down. Oh, it's a rask. Yeah. Rask city. These are amazing fish. Just looks wise. A bit too small to eat again, but this is a cork wing rask, guys. See the beautiful colours on it. They're almost like a mini grouper. Um, I've never eaten one. If I catch one a little bit bigger, I might try one, but look at the stunning colours on that. About the same size as my hand reel, actually, my hand line. Awesome, well hooked as well. Nice to catch another species. That's three species on the uh, hobo hand line there. But if I was, again, if I was in a survival situation, that would be eaten. That is how a fisherman wants his fish hooked. Look at that. Beautiful, back he goes. Try that. Guys, it wasn't as good as I thought. Fishing wasn't as good as I thought, to be honest. I got absolutely shattered in the rain. I had to put all the camera away. My GoPro got soaked and it's not in the right housing anyway, but it's not happening, guys, at the moment. It's looking pretty cloudy. I think I'm gonna try and find uh, a campsite. I'm gonna use the tent tonight. Try and find a campsite, as in a site to put the tent up and then, uh, you know, hopefully before dark and then get some food on. All I've got left is a bag of rice. I could have cooked those fish, but they were, that, that was undersized, that rice. You know, I don't really want to be killing something that's not even lived for a couple of weeks, so. Oh well, it'll live to fight another day. Hopefully I'll catch it when it's a bit bigger. Got to get back for Jack's tomorrow. So much rain, look. Look at it trickling off that rock. We literally had such a downpour, I got soaked. Skedaddle mate, let's skedaddle. Well guys, I've come away from the coast. There's been so many rain showers, heavy rain showers. I've been caught out a few times, but I've actually found uh, a rather nice woodland. I've come away from the sea for tonight because that, I, I got absolutely zero sleep last night. It was, although it was lovely being by the, uh, by the cliffs, I just got no sleep. So I've come away now, uh, further inland and found a little woodland and I'm gonna set up the tent just here behind me. There's a nice little area of like rhododendron bushes, so I'm gonna set up right here. This is my one-man tent, I've just been carrying it um, with my backpack on my back. Just been carrying it like that, just from the single carry handle. It's a really small tent, I've actually used it in my one of my videos recently, the mountain trip, so if you wanna check that out, I'll put a link in the video description for you. The tent itself is dead easy to put up. It's literally just two sets of poles for the head and the tail end of the tent. It's only about a kilo and a half, I think, this tent. It's really light. So easy to set up, that's why I like it, but it's very, sm very small space inside. In the other thing I like is that it's a really fast setup time. It takes like no time at all.
So it's two parts of the tent. There's the inner part, which is this part, which has a built-in ground sheet. Then there's the outer fly sheet here. So that's the inner part of the tent done. Now it's just a case of sliding this over the fly sheet and just pegging it down. It's not windy, so it's nice and easy to do. With this particular tent, actually what I like to do is peg the front end in first and then peg the back end in, and then I do the sides. That's just to keep the, the actual fly sheet level. So I'll just do that, pull that tight. Now I can do the sides from up here. Then I'll finish off with the, the guy lines at the end. <clears throat> Side rolls up like this. Good old and self inflating mat, let it do its job down there. It's had good use of this bad boy. And this is where the small one comes in handy. Sleeping bag. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Perfect, found a birch, bark, birch tree here. All the bark is, is peeling off, but that, that should light fairly nicely. I'm just gonna use a lighter, but that'd be great for the firebox. And look, it's just falling off this, this birch tree here. Absolutely perfect. Couldn't have, couldn't have asked for anything better, to be honest. It's a bit damp, but birch bark goes well in the damp. Let's take that back to camp. With the birch bark, even though it's really damp and muddy on this side, what I like to do is just keep peeling it into, into thin slivers and you sort of expose that resinous part of it just there when you peel it. Just every time you peel it, it tends to, some of the mud will stay on, but there, look, see? Some of the mud stays on and then you expose that dry resinous part and it's just worth just peeling, taking the time to peel it into thin slivers. It just burns a lot, lot better. And when you've got chunks of mud like that, just rip that bit off and then you keep the dry apart. Everything takes a bit more time when things are wet. You've got to process things a bit more and you know prepare your fire a little bit more each time. Sorry for the noise of the planes and everything. And further inland, so there's a bit more activity here. There's a road nearby I can hear. But I'm getting tired. It's getting well, we're in the evening time now, so Betty buys for me soon. I just want to process this up a little bit further. And then with the bigger bits, I'll just something like that. I'll just sort of halve it, halve it again, and keep it a little bit bigger just to build that flame up a bit. Then I've got my pencil st pencil sticks here and thicker twigs here. So start by finding a thin sliver that's relatively dry with a nice wispy curl on the end like that. Get the old jet lighter. And don't rush things. Let it burn on that inside. Meanwhile, let's get another one going. Plenty of time still. You want those flames to climb. They can go out really quickly when they're wet. Get the thin slivers in. Patience is important. 
birch bark can burn for a lot longer than you think, so it is good to be patient. This is obviously fairly smoky because it's wet. that bit done. Okay. Now you want to keep it going hot so twigs in, facing upright is fine. The flame will climb but it will uh, die down to embers as well so hopefully that carries on going. Don't want to overfill it now. Not much wind now as well, so the oxygen's not flowing very well. Yeah. Got me some of this Uncle Ben's rice, which is great because you barely need any water to uh, cook this rice. It only takes two minutes, so I'm literally just going to chuck a couple of these metal things on and we'll be away. Burns so efficiently once it gets going, this thing. So efficient. It's awesome. They are heavy, these fire boxes. They're heavier than the other ones out there, but they are awesome quality, I'm telling you now. Let's go put it on the edge because that's going to get going really soon. Damn, look at that flame. Good old open L number eight. I know a lot of you guys out there use the open I love them. Absolutely love mine. It's been a good trip. Enjoyed this trip. We've got tomato and basil rice. Sometimes I get the Mexican spicy chili one, and that is whew, hot, but it's nice. Right, it's not boiling yet, but that's starting to die down, so. The key with the fireboxes guys is, is keep feeding them, don't let them burn too low because they're much harder to get going, better to keep it going by feeding it regularly. Especially here in the UK is it's like a good leave no trace basis, they've got an ashtray at the bottom so you don't have to worry about scorching the ground, you don't have to worry about leaving a horrendous you know, mess of ashes afterwards, it just all burns down. Okay that's boiling, we are boiling. Nice quick food, plenty of carbs and energy in rice, as everyone knows. Ooh, she's gonna stick to the pan. So there's gaps in the firebox to plop sticks in if you need to. But that is some really good goodness in that. Oh. We're done. All the water's evaporated into the rice. Oh, look at that. Goodness. Mm. Kind of wish I had some fish with it though, but maybe I should have put some limpets in the rice. That would have been good. Seafood platter. But done a lot of trekking guys, done a lot of exercise, you just want to eat. Mm. Guys, I've stopped filming as I'm saving my battery so it's like 10 o'clock at night now. I'm getting sleepy, done a lot of walking, hiking, fishing, foraging, it's been a great day, really enjoyed it. So you guys, I'm going to say goodnight, um, one more night and then I've got to get home tomorrow about lunchtime to pick up Jack's. So. If you're still sticking by, I don't know, it must be over an hour now this episode, but kudos to you guys if you're still sticking around, I really appreciate it, thank you. Morning guys, actually had a much better sleep last night, 
probably because it's quieter, I'm away from the coast, and probably because I was really tired. It's looking like a really nice day actually. Sun's up already, it's beating me to it. And I've got the firebox going again with some birch bark. It's rained overnight, so everything's damp again, but good old birch bark coming through. And I'm going to boil up some water for a porridge, I think. But I'm just feeding this first to get it going. I've got two, uh, I've got two cans, like uh, containers. I don't really need to. I could just keep using the billy can, but you know it's had sea fish and things, uh, seafood in it and things like that, and it's just handy to have two if one gets really mucky. Besides, this goes as a nesting kit anyway, so this is already going in my backpack in the side pouch. I might as well just have this. It's barely any extra weight really. But let's get some porridge going. I always, always put too much water in with porridge. Always. Anyway, this is going good. Really good. A bit too good. So I'll have to let that die down a bit. Got me some oats so simple. Porridge oats, golden syrup. Great thing about this is you can burn the packet afterwards. Whoop. Again, I've put too much water in the porridge. When are you gonna learn, Mikey? When are you gonna learn, buddy? That is, look, it's energy, guys, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> I'll let that burn out now. Flip those off, actually. Spread the ashes a bit. You still there, guys? Anyone still there? If you're still sticking around, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Uh, this is the last day now, or sort of half day, really. I've got to, got to head back soon. But I've packed up the tent, got it all packed away. It's in its case. It's ready to carry. I'm all ready to go. But what I've done is I've actually laid all my gear out. Um, and I'm going to do a little gear load out for you guys just towards the end of the video. So if you're still around, really appreciate it. If you're interested in the gear that I use and how I pack it, that's what I'm going to show you now. So <clears throat> this is only a 25 litre backpack. This is an ex-military one. Uh, it's a day pack really. It's not designed for three nights overnight. So this is pretty much a lightweight camping trip that I've done. Um, in the top here is where I keep my Shemag, which I do use as a pillow sometimes on my more bushcrafty overnighters. Uh, but it's also great for a towel and just to, to general uses like a, a sling and things like that if I injure myself. It's just handy to have. So I've got my self-inflating mattress that goes in the back pouch. There's, there's three pouches in this main compartment here. <clears throat> so that one goes in there. And then next to it goes my inflatable pillow. Now I could sacrifice that and just use the shemag as a pillow, which I do do sometimes, but I've really gone for the space here to cram it in. Then I've got my tent and my sleeping bag over here. These go on the outside of my pack, so next up would be probably my billy can, my 10 centimeter zebra billy, which I keep in this waxed kind of canvas pouch, which is made for me by Tim at Blue Angelical Bushcraft. Go and check him out. That goes in this pouch here. This is where it starts to get a little bit tight. Like that. There we go. The firebox stove, the one I've been using for most of this trip, cooking up the uh, limpets and my breakfast and the, the rice and pasta and things. Uh, it's a flat pack stove and that goes down the back of my bag just to keep it nice and rigid on my back. So that usually, there's two clips here. That goes in there. Oh, just like that. <clears throat> I actually did bring my tinder pouch, which I didn't use in the end, but I brought it along anyway. That's got fire lighting things, uh, such as my flint and steel kit and a, a few bits of tinder, which I didn't actually use in the end, but tinder bag then goes above my billy can. This is uh, just a sort of possibles pouch as such. It's just got things like extra paracord, uh, my lighter where I keep my lighter in, um, a couple of carabiners and some extra cordage as well, other cordage string. So that goes in there as well. Uh, my Mora companion, 
that's what I was using uh, down at the sea and just in general it's the one that I use uh, for my sort of sea stuff it is a carbon one so it has rusted a fair bit I should probably get a stainless steel one for the sea but nice cheap knife you can get these on Amazon I'll pop a link in the description really good knives that goes in then this side pouch not side pouch but this second compartment here folding Barco Laplander didn't use it on this trip really I just snapped all the twigs that I needed but in case I needed to process larger wood that just uh, it's a folding saw it goes in there uh, and then I've got let's have a look gas stove and the well, gas and the gas stove is in this this black bag here used that obviously on the first night that time uh, always good for backup and emergencies that goes over on this side right near the top now we're getting low on space flashlight torch um, I do have a head torch I can't seem to find it at the moment but uh, this is just a, a flashlight one instead so the torch goes in there. and then I've got over here another camera lens uh, bear in mind guys I've also got to take my camera gear so it's not just uh, camping gear that's in my bag it's camera gear as well so this is a spare lens which I do use every now and then I haven't really used it much on this trip I've just stuck with the stock 18 to 55 mil lens uh, but there's that's another lens there uh, this is uh, where I keep all my camera batteries in I've got spare batteries I've got spare camera chips I've got my uh, wind protector for the microphone I've got wipes I've got spare batteries for the microphone, spare camera chips, the lot. That's all in there, there's quite a bit of quite a bit of weight to it really because of all the batteries. I've got about six batteries in there for the camera. That goes in here. We're getting there. Uh, Openel number eight. Just keeping that, that's my kind of food processing knife. I like to keep my main cutting knife and food processing knife separate just for you know hygiene purposes really. Nice and small, that actually goes in the side pocket, but I can put it in there just for space. That is the main pocket complete. As you can see, it's pretty tight. So, I don't know if you guys can see this. So that's the main compartment there, as you can see. There's three compartments, there's one here, one under the gas stove here, then there's that separating the backpack, and there's a back compartment there. So, it doesn't shut completely tight, but it does the best it can. That then folds over, clips in, folds over, clips in. That's my main compartment done of the backpack. Now if we come to this side pouch, this perfectly fits my Pathfinder stainless steel bottle and canteen set, like nesting cup. And just give it a bit of a wipe. Uh, and they perfectly fit in there, which is ideal. It's what I wanted when I was choosing a pack. Something that had tall side pouches. And that sits in there. I've then got <clears throat> the lid to the nesting cup, tucked down the back like that. Then I've got my spork, which goes in generally in that gap there. And my bottle hanger here as well, which goes the other side. That's everything I need in that compartment. That's that side pouch. And to the other side pouch. In here I keep my first aid kit, my Pentagon first aid kit, which I showed you a bit earlier in the video. That slots down in there first. Then I have my nuts, trail mix, dried fruit, just easily accessible so I don't have to open my main compartment when I'm hiking. I then have salt and pepper, which I didn't really need to use, and some alcohol gel, which is really handy if you want to clean your hands, uh, because Obviously it dries in the air, you don't have to need you don't need water with it. So alcohol cleaning gel or hand gel, antiseptic hand gel, whatever you want to call it, that goes in there as well. Then I shut that pocket. And then that's everything on the inside of the pack, and it's all to do with outside. So I lay the pack down and I've got my two straps here. I'll just show you again just quickly how I use them so you guys can see exactly how I pack my bag straight from the off so that tucks under there the, which is the arm strap and then it just sits like that this does the same tucks under the arm strap usually it should go through this as well actually there that first sort of alice clip alice loop whatever you want to call it there like that then i lay them out ready 
nice and straight if I can. And then, oh, oop, sleeping bag here goes on the bottom. Try and get one side clipped in first. Better to loosen it when you do it. I've done it when it's tight. If you do it loose and then tighten it, it's a little bit better. And then I get the other side tucked in like that. That's my sleeping bag now wedged on the bottom. All that's left is my tent. And that's where this carabiner up here comes in handy. If you can see that, I just loop that over there. And that tent then sits on the sleeping bag on top. Guys, I just want to say thank you very much. If you're still watching, I seriously do appreciate it. Uh, you've definitely got some patience. I know it's a long video, but thanks again so much. If you are subscribed to TA Outdoors, if you're not, please do. Um, I'd be really grateful. Tick the bell notification, the bell button, so that you can select all notifications so you never miss an upload when I, when I do upload a video. It goes straight to your email, hopefully. And hit the like button if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you again soon in another video. Cheers, guys. Take care. Summer's gone, but you can be my winter love. Summer's gone, but you can be mine. The world stops spinning when you open your eyes, my darling. What a beautiful soul you are. So, so, so. Fast the only way